up and welcome to another episode of Headbangers Kitchen. We've got sick on the show today all the way from the UK and I'm going to be cooking up a sick kebab for them which is my take on the traditional Sikh kebab made from beef and wrapped in a delicious soft flatbread with some kachumbar and a delicious garlic and spring onion dip to go with it. It's going to be epic and metal. Let's go make that Sikh kebab. So we're first going to make the dough for our flatbread because this needs time to rest. And what will happen is the yeast that we use in the dough is going to sort of make the dough rise and you're going to have a delicious soft flatbread. So we're going to take a cup of all-purpose flour and add in some salt to that. And for some extra flavor, we're going to add in some cumin powder. Now you can use whatever kind of seasoning you like. You can add pepper, you can add garlic, you can add garam masala, you can add chili. The world is your oyster. Use whatever you want in your naan. So I'm just going to mix these dry ingredients in and then I'm going to add a nice big glug of olive oil. Now I'm not sticking to the typical Indian flavors which is why I'm going for olive oil but you can use whatever oil you have at home. I'm just going to mix this in together nicely. And you'll see that the uh, dough is sort of coming together little by little. And to this, I'm going to add half a cup of water uh, to which I've added some yeast and is now all active and bubbly and all that. So I'm going to add this in and mix it together. And the yeast is what will help the dough to sort of rise and make it nice and soft. So just add that in and mix everything together. As you can see, I don't like getting my hands dirty, so I'm using a spoon. But feel free to go in there with your hands. I will eventually do that anyway. So now you can see all your dough is coming together nicely. And you want a nice soft dough. If the dough is too hard, then your flatbread will be more crispy. So if you prefer a crispy flatbread, you know, make a stiff dough. Now it's time for me to get down and dirty with this dough. So I'm just going to put a little oil on my hands and work that dough. Once all of it has come together like this, we're just going to take the dough out, put a little flour on our work surface, a little on the dough, and just knead the dough. Now once we are done kneading the dough, I'm just going to put a little more oil on it. Just get that nice and oiled up. So now that this is done, we're going to cover this with a damp towel and leave it for an hour in a nice warm spot to almost double in size. And then we can make our delicious flatbread from it. Alright, so now it's time to make the kebab that goes into the sixth kebab. And I'm using 500 grams of beef mince and you can make this kebab with whatever meat you like. You can use chicken, pork, mutton, lamb, uh, turkey, kangaroo, alligator, whatever animal is legal and available in your supermarket. So I'm going to start by just seasoning it with some salt, some freshly ground pepper. some cayenne pepper for a little bit of heat, some paprika for a nice smoky flavor. I'm using something called sumac which gives it a slightly tangy and lemony flavor. Now if you can't find sumac you can just use a little bit of lemon juice or uh, even some lemon zest you know to sort of give it a little bit of freshness. Uh, I'm also going to spice it up a little bit with some garam masala and some cumin powder. I'm also going to add some ginger garlic paste. And finally, my last ingredient is fried onion paste. Now, if you're wondering what is this fried onion paste, you basically chop up two onions, deep fry it, and then make a paste out of it. And this adds a next level of flavor. I mean, you got to taste it to believe it. Then we're going to mix all these together. 
So now the kebab mixture is ready and I'm going to shape the kebabs and I'm going to use metal skewers because uh, I don't know I just like the way it turns out with that you don't have to use a skewer you can make it in whatever shape or form you like and you can grill these or pan fry them whatever your choice I'm going to pan fry it though so you take your skewer take a good helping of the beef now I'm looking to make four massive sick kebabs so I'm taking a big chunk of meat I'm just going to skewer it on ladies and gentlemen this has been performed by professionals please do try this at home that's one big ass sick kebab so our kebabs have been made and are now ready to be cooked not quite though I'm going to leave it in the fridge for about 15 minutes just to firm up meanwhile I'm going to whip up a delicious kachumbar or a salsa and a yogurt based dip to go with the kebab so let's put these in the fridge for 15 minutes before I pan fry them so now we're going to make the kachumbar or salad or salsa or whatever you want to call it that's going to go in our sikh kebab and I'm going to use one grated carrot and just use your normal kitchen grater to grate this half of a white radish grated as well and some freshly chopped coriander I'm going to just squeeze a little lime over this a small glug of olive oil a little salt a little pepper and a wee bit of paprika and you can also chop up a green chili and add it to this if you like it spicy and now I just mix all of this together give it a little taste perfecto mando this will go nicely in our kebab so we're gonna put this in the fridge as well now to chill and make our yogurt dip so now we're going to make a delicious garlic and spring onion and yogurt dip which we're going to use on our kebab so I'm going to start by using 200 grams of yogurt and to that I'm going to add some cream cheese now what you can also do is if you don't want to use cheese you can just hang the curd for a while which will give it a firm texture and you won't need the cheese then I'm just going to mix these two together now to this I'm going to add one chopped spring onion this gives it a delicious flavor as well as some crunch next I add in some chopped garlic mix this in well we're just going to give it a sprinkling of salt a little bit of black pepper and one final mix give it a little taste that's perfectly seasoned so now we're going to leave this to chill in the fridge while we get our sikh kebab ready so now we're going to fry our kebabs and like I said earlier you can barbecue these you can cook them any way you like I find that pan frying is the easiest way to cook them and uh, that's exactly what I'm going to do so I've got my pan on a medium high heat and I'm just going to pour in some oil in fact I'm using the same oil in which I cook the onions so what that does is it adds a slight depth of flavor because of the onions and make sure your pan is nice and hot and place your sick kebab in it now I'm just gonna fry two at a time because these guys are massive this should take about two to three minutes tops on each side I'm gonna turn one here So our kebabs are now fried and ready. It's time to make the flatbread and then assemble the sikh kebab. So as you can see our dough has risen quite a bit and now it's time to roll out our flatbread. So I'm just going to flour uh, my work surface a little bit as well as my hands and I'm going to just break out a piece of the dough just as much as I would need for the flatbread. And you can see it's lovely, spongy and elastic. And I'm just going to roll this out. Now it's time to cook this. 
and ideally you should use a non-stick pan for this so that nothing sticks there's nothing worse than broken flat bread pick up your bread flat bread and just lay it out in the pan now it's time to flip it over you can see it's cooked nicely on this side I'm just going to add a small knob of butter and just rub this all over the naan and our flatbread is ready and now it's time to assemble the sick kebab so now it's time the moment you've all been waiting for the moment where we assemble the sick kebab so our flatbread is ready and we're going to use some of that kachumbar aka salad aka salsa whatever you want to call it then we add our kebab now remember to take the skewer out yes and finally we drizzle on some of that delicious garlic and spring onion dip that we made look at that delicious and creamy so there you have it folks the sixth kebab is ready and i'm going to wait for sixth to come and taste this now welcome back to headbangers kitchen my guests today are one of the sickest bands on the planet they were a band that was ahead of their time and are one kick-ass live act I've got with me the pioneers of the modern progressive genre from the UK. I've got Dan and Dan from Sick. Hey guys, how are you doing? Good, good, thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for the intro as well. Oh, my yes. pleasure. <laughs> so first up, I mean, you guys had a kick-ass set last night. You just you. blew Mumbai away. How was it for you guys? How was the experience? Oh, it was incredible. Wasn't yeah, it? awesome. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> feel really privileged to be able to come all the way over here and play a show like that. And uh, to get that kind of reaction the first time you come to a country is amazing. Yeah, we were well pleased. It's, yeah, it's great. One of the, it's one of those nights where you sort of you keep looking out, thinking, "Is this actually happening? <laughs> is it such a such a unique experience for us?" You know. So yeah. And uh, how was the festival for you guys? I mean, you apart from your performance, obviously, how did you like the vibe of the festival? You know. Um, great. It was awesome. I mean, uh, it was actually really well organised. The the sound was great. All the bands sounded really good. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not quite up to <laughs> health and safety standards in the UK in some <laughs> ways, but I think it's got a lot of character. It's amazing to see a festival in a place like that, and uh, very unique. Smashing up that car, that car and yes. the sledgehammer. Did you have a go at it? I didn't. He did. Yeah, yeah, I did. I was, was straight that? in there. Uh, Pin had a go as well. Yeah. Didn't it? Was it, it therapeutic in any way? Yeah, well, we, we were sort of, you know, in the midst of jet lag, so being able to smash something was kind of quite a nice way of waking yourself up. But uh, no, it was amazing. And I have to say, like, you know, we have been around the world a bit, and, and generally, you know, Indian people, I think English and Indian people really connect on a personality level. We're very similar. There's a lot of the same banter. So that's one thing I'll personally take away from come into India is just how cool everyone is but it's been been really pleasurable to hang out with people you know you can really connect with people it's the same with our friends from Nepal as well I think there's a real common ground between us on yeah, a personality yeah. level which really. is really important because you know that's part of traveling in a band isn't just playing a gig and remembering that and yeah. then leaving it's sort of making friends that's important for us so that's something that's special that we can take away and uh, you had the vocalist of Underside join you guys on stage yeah. for a song. So how did that come about? Was that planned or was it like <coughs> a spontaneous thing? I think Mikey had asked him to do it before the show, yeah. We knew that uh, and another sinking ship was the one that he wanted to do. So, uh, yeah, and that was great. We really enjoyed it. And he's really good, that guy. Like, yeah, he's, yeah. He's a really great metal vocalist and a lovely guy. And they were so good to us when we were in Kathmandu. They put us up and, you know, we spent a lot of time with them. So, um we knew he was really into that song, so it was just seemed like a nice thing to do. Awesome, that's fantastic. So, uh, let's talk a little bit about your music now. You know, uh, you guys started out way back in 99, 2000 approximately, I think. Mm -hmm. And the kind of music that you played, a lot of people believe that has like, sort of laid the foundation for what we call gent or modern progressive metal today. Uh, you know, how did you guys go in this direction, you know, what inspired you to sort of create this kind of music? Uh, it's probably a, I mean, it's, hard, it's quite a hard thing to say, I think. I think it, one of the things we're lucky with, with our band, and I think which is why we've created a sound that's maybe quite unique, was that we're individually, we're all quite unique as musicians and we're quite ambitious, you know. Um, 
So when you put people like that together, that that because normally with bands you have maybe one or two really creative people, and then everybody else just joins in to be in a band and they sort of play what the other guys write. Whereas with Sixth, everybody was very driven at their own instrument, so that was something that enabled us to make music that maybe not every band could make. You know, there wouldn't you'd be very it'd be very hard for the average band to come and cover a Sixth song because you'd need to be able to play drums like him or whatever. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Or you'd need to have two singers, one with kind of Mikey's voice or whatever. So it, when you put unique elements together, it just kind of creates something that sort of sits on its own. And I think that's why we were lucky, really. And it kind of—I mean, I can say while he's here with me now, we, me and Pin formed the band, but it was only when Dan joined that it became this really unique thing because the rhythmic element to the band is, is such a key part. Yeah. Um, so that that changed everything, you know. I mean. Yeah, like I said, for me, one of the things that really appealed to me about way back when I was asked to join it is just uh, the the ambition of, of the guys, you know, him and Pin went to school together, but pretty much everyone else, and originally the guys that were in the band before before us, before anyone really heard the music that we make now, uh, you guys went to school together, but it was always your ambition to try and push things as much as you possibly could. And unlike any band I've been in, it was like, let's find the very best musicians that we can. I mean, that's more common these days. You know, people are making projects with people from all over the world, over the internet. But back when we were making bands, it was just like you formed a band with the best musicians that you knew in the local area, and yeah. then you went out and gigged. Whereas these guys from well, day no, one... There was no internet situation. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Whereas these guys from day one were like, nah, we want to do this, and if you can't do this, we're going to find someone who can do this. And <laughs> yeah, then... we were really quite ruthless in a... In an honest way, we were like, we know what we want to do. And but me and Pin had grown up listening to all the sort of classic metal bands, classic Metallica and Pantera and Sepultura, but we were also really into death metal. We used to go to lots of death metal gigs. And we were never into the, the kind of the imagery side of death metal. We were just into the riffs and the music and the writing and the playing. And we taught ourselves to play guitar. So me and Pin would often teach each other, like, how are you doing that? And that, so we pushed each other on. But we felt like there was... Um, a gap there for, for something to be extremely technical and extremely progressive but not to have all the death metal imagery to have all the kind of the sort of more macabre vision uh, visual stuff more of a kind of um well it was only when we find, found mikey that suddenly the personality to the music came through with the lyrics and stuff so i think we felt like there was something melodic and really embracing that could be made that could still be really technical um because you know six songs are all kind of built of ultimately tiny little hooks and melodies whether it be the, the rhythms or the, or the riffs or the vocals that they're, they're chock full of melody there's never anything really just atonal for the sake of it yeah. you know so i also want to ask you what's the story behind the name sick that's one of the questions that we always hate to answer i mean i wasn't there when you guys come up with it but i'm kind of assuming that it's something to do with the fact that there were six members it's literally that it's, it's, we were in pin's parents living room with our old drummer, funnily enough, Gaz, and uh, we were just couldn't come up with a name, and we had all these terrible names. <laughs> like, you know, when you, we've all been there in a metal band, you're just writing lists of names that you write, you say it out loud, and then everyone goes, yeah, yeah, and then you leave the room, and you come back in, and you go, what the, f that's the worst name ever. So it, we we just ended up looking at the fact that there were six of us, and then someone said sixth with an X, and we thought that just looks a bit crap, and then someone just said, why don't we just change it for a K, and then we were like, yeah. <laughs> and that was it. So when you guys started out, what was it like uh, touring back then and also what was the kind of response that you guys got to the music that you were playing? Because like I mentioned, I felt that it was sort of ahead of its time almost, you know, in some ways. Well, so the band kind of went through uh, stages, I suppose. When we first came out, it was like, obviously, no one really cared that much. When we, we did that initial first ever tour together with this lineup, which everyone knows, no one really knows the lineup before me, uh, James and Justin joined, but uh, we did a tour with the new band, the incarnation that everyone knows, and we did a tour of Kent, right, when we were sleeping in cars and on floors, and yeah. at that time it was like no one really knew, I mean these guys had done a tour before, but uh, not that many people knew the band, and they certainly didn't know any of the new songs we were playing, so, and also I think at that time, uh, people were really like, what the hell is this? I don't know if it's good or bad, what the hell is it? But um, it seemed that it was starting to generate some interest and it was a kind of new sound for a lot of people and we got picked up by uh, 
Mary Ann Hobbs, who worked for Radio One Rock Show back then, and she started playing us a lot, and the, the band started to really gather momentum and gain a following, and we kind of our career was kind of going really well and then there's something that kind of happens to bands when they get stuck in the UK and we never really branched out. We're doing a lot more foreign shows now than we ever did back then so we kind of got stuck in this small little world that the UK is and back then the press really kind of owned the music scene a lot more than it does now. Now everything's online, if people want to find out about a band they find out themselves, they don't need to buy a weekly magazine in order yeah. to tell them what's cool, what's not, who to go and see, what's on. It's like it's all there on the internet. So the magazines and the press don't have that kind of power. But, but um, you know, there's something that happens to a band when they come out and it's new and fresh, everyone talks about it. After a while, it's like, oh, yeah, they're playing all the time. So our career didn't really go downwards, but it just didn't seem that there was the same buzz about the band. And, uh, and we went off and did a second record, which we consider to be our best record. And I wouldn't say it didn't get a good reaction, but there wasn't the kind of buzz around the band that there was in the first couple of years. So it kind of felt like that our career was petering out a little bit and then people split off. And then this amazing thing happened in the years away is that people really got to grips with the band and finally got what we were about. And it took people, you know, a few years to really understand and appreciate what we do, I guess. So yeah, it's like, quite, it's quite a, a satisfying feeling because we kind of knew when we were writing the music, we had a feeling that a lot of people should and will connect to this, but maybe not yet, you know. But yeah, and the first EPs and the first album, we were like that kind of buzz band, you know. But after a while, yeah, because, I mean, it, it comes down to... Um, it comes down to money most of the time. Bands that get on the cover of magazines and things are the bands that can sell copies of magazines. Equally, the bands that are all over the press all the time, it's because some way, shape or form their, their popularity is making them money. But with a band like Sixth, we kind of took on our fan base and everybody became obsessed with Sixth that was in the Sixth circle and got their Sixth tattoos and stuff. But then that was it. There was nothing beyond that. We had our little world. and So when we went to do our second album tour, our our tours would always be well sold out and packed, but it would always be our core fans, which, which is why we're still here now and why we've uh, that fan base developed. Because people who really fall in love with a the band, they they don't just go off them, you know, they stay yeah. with them forever, and they tell their mates and their brothers and sisters and all the rest of it. Whereas there's bands that were on the cover of Kerrang back then who were much bigger than us that nobody knows who they are now. So I think we're we're lucky with that. I think the fact that we put our, our effort into our music is why we're sat here now being able to have, have fans across the world. It's because people, I think, maybe, yeah, I mean, maybe it was a bit early for that stuff and now people get it and they realise the importance of it, um, which is a really, on a personal front, like on a songwriter's front, is the most satisfying thing. Like, Definitely. And you were talking about, you know, bands suffering because of money and not having money to sort of keep going as a band. So how has it been for you guys, like back in the day when you were, you know, when you started out to say vis-a-vis -vis now when, you know, you are sort of uh, that big band, at least to in our eyes, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, I think when, when we first uh, started, we were just, you know, we're obviously all, all in with parents, etc, etc, all had shitty jobs and then, and then when we signed our first record deal, it was for quite a lot of money. And we, we, we didn't, instead of taking money in our pockets, which would have been a bad idea, we decided to spread it out and take a small wage. And you now we managed to survive through most of our early to mid 20s, but very. But you were doing music full time? For full time, yeah. yeah, for a good five or six years. Um, and we were lucky, but, but really, in, you know, we weren't in any way comfortable. It was very, it was hard. Um, but because you're always doing band stuff and you, you, you know, because you live with your parents, or whatever, you can afford to just do it. But um, no, I mean that then, you know, being in a being in a band, full stop, is a hard way to make a living. Being in a metal or progressive metal band, where you're not gonna get a lot of the opportunities a lot of sort of poppy young bands would get, so it's not feasible to be able to make a living. The only way you can do it is from merchandise and live. And I guess if we were to come back and do sixth full time now, yeah, we're more popular. Yeah, we get paid more money. We could probably make a really good living doing it um, if we did it full time. Um, but you know, it's 
it's weird. It's, it's, it's ironic, really, because if we'd have been in that position then, everything would have been fine and the band probably wouldn't have split up. Because yeah. you get to your late 20s and you're like, I don't have enough money to survive here, and you have partners who want you to sort of support them or whatever. Being in a band's a hard thing to, 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 it's a hard thing to base your life around, you know, because it has a kind of a limit. So I wouldn't say we ever got rich doing six. Well, I definitely wouldn't say that. <laughs> and, we, and, we, um, and will we ever get rich doing six? Probably not. But, but I think now at least we can justify being able to put time into it because at least it can cover our, it can cover life a bit more. And we can pick and choose the things that we want to do now. It's more of a, it's on our own terms. Like no one's, uh, we're not tied into anything. If we don't want to do something, we don't have to. It's we, something we always agree on as the six of us. Like we'd love to come to play a festival in Mumbai. Let's go do it. You know, mm. we don't have to go and do. You know, I think back in the day, we probably made loads of stupid business decisions not being aware of the kind of impact that they have but I mean one of the biggest things is like I said before getting stuck in the UK you know if we'd have you know signed different record deals and and gone further afield then your career would be different you can survive that way but when you get stuck in just one small market you can't keep touring the same places over and over yeah. again playing to the same crowds over and over again it's just you're you know, eventually it's, your popularity is going to wane. But mm. now and that though, always came down to money, didn't it? And management decisions. It was yeah. always a, we can't afford to do this, we can't afford to do that. And back then, you take advice um, and you do as you're told, kind of thing. But we ended up just touring just to pay things for previous expenses as well. Like yeah. the last couple of years were tough. Like I can see why the band kind of split up. Yeah, we'd had a lot of, we'd had a, in a nutshell, we'd had a really acrimonious, bad split with our first label um, for, for one reason or another which which ultimately because of the contractual clauses meant that we money that there was about eighty thousand pounds that should have been in our account that ultimately wasn't so we we were in a lot of mm. debt so for the last three or four years of the band we we made no money every penny that came into the band was to pay off yeah, our yes. creditors yeah. because this money that should have come in never came in so when you're when you're when you're playing gigs night and day, when you're getting shouted at by your girlfriend or whatever, I won't speak for you, but I bloody was <laughs> like, when you're like, why haven't you got any money? And when your friends are going, but the band's popular, but why have you got no money? And, and things like that. After a while, it starts to take its toll, you know. And then when you start to find other ways of earning, <coughs> earning money outside of the band, like for me, it's producing. Um, you start to realize, you start to associate a lot of negativity with being in a band, you know. And I remember quite kind of symbolically our very last ever London gig, which was Islington Academy, which was sort of like the 2007. I think that the last pennies of the debt we owed was paid off, and we were square, apart from about a thousand pounds with someone. And it was kind of, it was symbolic as well. Well, the band's over and we got here, and every penny we've ever made <laughs> has not gone in our pockets. The last two years were spent paying off the debt just to then split up. <laughs> it was like. Yeah. So the only memories you can have are the good ones, like yeah. playing on stage, um, wow. and the good, the good, the good bits. But everything else, in, if we're honest, was shit behind the scenes. We the were, last couple you know, of years were, were tricky. I mean, that's what's so great about it coming back now, though, is that uh, you know the band has, you know, it's been self-generating fans in the time that we've gone. Like all the work that we put back in then, obviously, wasn't. A waste of time because we're now able to come and do stuff like this so uh, yeah it was, it's, it's the positive sort of yeah uh, so, next chapter nice and uh, so like you said you know the music really spread while you guys were away mm. you know and uh, obviously you had people in India downloading and listening to it so what's your take on the whole downloading music piracy thing uh, especially for you guys because I, I think it's helped a band like yours in you know, more ways than one can imagine. You know. Yeah, it's, I think it's different for every band. Um, for us, thank God for it, to be honest, because there's no way we'd be popular in Nepal and India and play places far afield without the internet. Because, yeah, you just wouldn't be able to buy a copy of our album. But, I mean, this is the thing. Obviously, initially, it, it seemed like, ah, because we, you know, we were fortunate enough to sign a, a deal just before the internet had this huge like impact on the music sales. I mean, I remember, you know, being able to copy CDRs and thinking, amazing, I can just borrow a record of my mate and just copy and have a digital version of it. And that was like, wow. And then it was like, 
LimeWire and everyone downloading stuff. And uh, you know, our first record deal was just on the cusp of that time, so we were kind of st we still got a good record deal. But uh, you know, the scene's changed, and people are still making a living now. It's just in a different way. You know, you make your money from your merchandise and and your your touring, but. Uh, it seems like the infrastructure is there to make that work now. Bands are coming back and they're doing, and I think that's maybe why you're seeing so many bands reform now because that that kind of downloading thing probably did have an impact on their career. And at that time, you know, there wasn't as many shows or as well-paid shows, or you know, people weren't buying as much merch or whatever, and uh, it must have affected their careers. And now it's like people can come back and do what they love doing. You just don't expect to make a, a, a lot of money from your record. Your record is what you make in order to promote your touring and your, yeah, your, your merchandise. Yeah, everything else. That's the thing, you can't pirate a live act. That's the beauty yeah. of a live act. You can't, you can't fake that. That will always be there. And bands will always, apart from bootlegging, bands will always be able to sell t-shirts. Because, again, people want official merchandise. So, really, if people reset their minds and how they expect to make money from being in music and accept that like you say the music part is is the bit that we'll just give away because we have to accept mm. give that away but it facilitates everything else so like totally. and, and ironically bands can make i mean that's the thing we get paid really well to come and do a show like this in mumbai because people pirated our music yeah. so i know you've probably answered this before but what was the reason you guys did split up and what has brought you back now? Yeah, I mean, I suppose we have kind of answered that in previous. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we were the death, obviously. About. Exactly. But was yeah. that the only thing or was there anything? Uh, else? Loads of things. I think, uh, I think if we had have been making money off, off the band in the last two years, it probably wouldn't have come to a head so quickly. But I think it was going that way anyway. I think that uh, there was sort of direction. As musicians, I think we were really happy working together. The four of us were like getting better and better at, at you know, bouncing ideas off each other and working together in, in the rehearsal room and at home and writing. But there was more and more of a rift coming between the musicians and the singers, I guess. Like Mikey wanted to just write his ideas at home on Pro Tools and, you know. He didn't it, want to connect with us. He didn't want anymore. to connect with us at that point, yeah. So. And he would, he would admit that now that he. He fell out of love with being in a band and being in this band. And, um, and metal, he wasn't really, he was listening to lots of sort of alternative stuff, loads of Nick Cave and Leonard Cohen and ev anything that wasn't metal basically. <laughs> and uh, so there was obviously this divide between us. But I mean, I think that gets exacerbated when, you know, you don't have any money, do you know what I mean? Yeah, so yes. you look for a way out kind yeah. of thing. And, and, um, and he, he, he clearly didn't want to do the other things that came along with being in a band. Like we'd be offered tours in America, we'd be offered this, that, that. Mikey just didn't want to do it. He, he was done, I think. So there was even talk, and he suggested at one stage, he said, look, I'll, I'll sing on the records, but just get someone else to do my bits live. And we, and we realised at that point, well, this is not going to work. <laughs> you know. And, but that's how he felt at that time. Right? And he, he, I think he regretted that. <coughs> but equally, you know, I'm great believer in fate so that was right at that moment team. yeah because now we're back and now I think he he appreciates what he's achieved with the band a lot more now because he's been without it yeah. and he's realized the good things about it not just the negative so yeah you put all those things together and also what's the yeah it was the getting to your late 20s and for me I'm quite a key part of the band creatively and I fell out of love with it too because I was starting to make a living producing other people's records and realized wow, I can actually afford to eat dinner tonight, you know. And I was quite inspired by that. And I thought of sick as this negative part of my life. It was quite, it just, it's sad that money can have that effect, really. But it's, you need to be able to live, so. Um, but, you know, we've, no, none of us have ever, especially the musicians, I mean, the pride that we have in our music has never gone away. I've always just felt completely proud of what we've achieved, you know. And I've always heard the music and felt, positive always I've never sort of gone oh god sick you know yeah so that's why it's easy to pick it up now and play it again it's really fun in a way actually isn't it just be able to get out there and play those songs oh, amazing, that we're so yeah. proud of in front of so many people and see that kind of reaction like we had last night so yeah the feeling yeah. you get from playing that sort of music you know 
certain elements to the songs where you just have a grin on your face, think, wow, wow, you know, because it's it's putting everyone together and making everyone play at the same time and creating a noise. That's the beauty of being in a band, and you can't you can't fake that. It's such yeah. a thing. It's a combination of um, everybody's skills put together. Right, so we are a food show at the end of the day. So I'm going to ask you guys, what do you like to eat? What are your favorite foods? I do really like curries actually, and, and hot foods. So. Uh, this is dream, dream gig for you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really into Thai food. I spent a lot of time in Thailand, so I love Thai curries and Massaman curries. Um, Those are really good too. I absolutely love them. And I love tapas. Eat a lot of Spanish food. Okay. Have you eaten any interesting food while you've been here in India? Uh, I haven't eaten as much as kind of like. I mean, I had some a tikka paneer. Uh, my ex was a vegetarian. She used to eat paneer curries all the time. So I had a I had a paneer wrap, which was really nice, which was really hot. Yeah, the wraps were good. They were pretty hot. I like hot food, but they're pretty hot. I yeah. But but they were hot good. for you, then I'm. They were really a, hot for me. I threw a chili in your sick kebab. Okay, so make good. his <laughs> brutal, but not not mine. No chance. <laughs> my glasses will steam up. <laughs> and you guys, I know this is. Generally hard to answer, but do you guys have any like interesting, funny stories from your time on the road that you know is etched in your memory? God, loads. Yeah, I'm just trying to think which ones we can say. Trying to think of any that wouldn't be really embarrassing for certain members of the band, because <laughs> generally, like a funny story involves someone doing re something really stupid, embarrassing, and so. Uh, yeah. Well, any stage accidents? Let's start with that. Oh, I, just, I mean, Dan will love telling you about how I fell off the stage. I'm sure. Oh yeah, he. Yeah, he's fallen off the stage before. There's a few a, times, and not There's a really <coughs> funny one, but I might have to tell you those off camera because I think <laughs> certain individuals will get offended by that. But there's a, a certain one involving someone taking some laxative tea before the show, not realizing it was laxative tea, oh. rushing to the toilet, realizing there was no toilet paper, and then having to go through the venue to the girls' toilet and missing the first song. <laughs> yeah. I won't tell you who that was. They weren't present on the stage. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so maybe a hardcore six fan can go through all the videos and find out which show had a missing member in the first song. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, do you guys have any uh, hobbies that are like, what do you guys like to do for fun, apart from playing music, obviously? Uh, yes. I, uh, I go to the cinema a lot. I love watching movies, play golf. Play a lot of golf, and I'm obsessed with um, Formula One. Like completely obsessed. Yeah, man. To be honest with you, it's hard to think because most of the time you, we are making music or trying to make a living, and uh, I like traveling. So you know, this this is this great for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, movies, I suppose. Awesome. And a lot of uh, metal musicians actually don't listen to too much metal, like you know you mentioned mm. earlier. So, do you guys still listen to a lot of metal? And you know what's on your playlist currently? I do listen to a lot of metal, but it do does tend to be the same metal that I was listening to sort of ten years ago. So I I'm trying to think of uh, any bands that come out recently that I find really exciting. Even the ones that I think of aren't that recent. I mean, Gojira are cool. I mean, they're not that recent now, but uh, they're a good band. But yeah, a new stuff that's come out that's exciting to listen What's to. What's on your iPod? What's on my iPods? Uh, loads of stuff. All of us are really into kind of 90s metal, I guess, the kind of metal that we grew up listening to. So I reckon all of our iPods have got loads of Pantera, Slayer, Metallica, Megadeth, that kind of stuff. Sepultura. Sepultura, obviously. Alice in Chains. Alice in Chains, yeah. Um, Lots of sort of 90s crowbar. metal. Crowbar. Crowbar. Yeah, we, 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 we kind of, I wouldn't say we're stuck in our ways, but kind of we, our, 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 our values in terms of metal and how we think of metal and creating music, it, it's never been bettered since then, to be honest. And it's not us being old and out of touch. Yeah. I think, although there's a lot of great musicians now and the gent scene has proven that, there's a lot of people who can really play. Um, I personally think the Sugar have got a lot more to do with that than Sixth have, if I'm honest. But equally, I think a lot of metal hasn't advanced. A lot of the, a lot of the bands that have done really well in metalcore and all that stuff. They're all heavily influenced by bands and very sounding very similar to bands like At the Gates or Slayer or Pantera. Mm -hmm. And I personally think, in the '90s, it was done in the best way. Um, I can't imagine why I'd want to listen to most metal bands when I could go back and listen to Far Beyond Driven because I think it was just yeah. 
the, the pinnacle <coughs> of heavy metal. On that note, are you ready to taste the sixth kebab? Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Starving. Let's go get that sixth kebab. <laughs> so we're back. And guys, here's the sixth kebab for you. Looks Please incredible. Please dig in. Excellent. Thank you very much. So how do you eat it? Just, just you just fold it and hand. dig it. Yeah, and the yeah. plate is there because it is juicy, <laughs> I think. Oh, this is going to be a mess. Mm. This looks amazing, dude. Right, well. That's great. <laughs> mm. That's, That's incredible, dude. Thank you. That's our own special kebab. Yes, you have your own Thank special you sick kebab. It's so good, man. Mm. It really is. Really nice. <clears throat> awesome. So sick. I've given the thumbs up to the sick kebab. We'll see you on the next episode of Headbangers Kitchen.